Good evening. You've tuned in to ET now, and this is the Money Show with me, Karunya Rao. And it's Friday, so we have a very, very special lineup uh, planned for our viewers on the show. We'll start off with the Money Show Kitty Party, and we have very, very exciting guests who are joining us right here on the show today. Let me quickly introduce them for you. It's uh, first up, we have Radhika Hari Bhakti, who's a director at RH Financial Services, and that's not the only role that she has to her credit. She's been uh, uh, on the board of several organizations. She's chaired many committees uh, within those organizations. We'll come to that in great detail. Thank you so much, Radhika, for joining us this evening. Apart from that, we also have Ms. Neha Bagaria. She's the founder and CEO of Jobs for Her. And finally, we also have Flavia Agnes, who is women's rights lawyer, and she's also the co-founder of Majlis. Thank you so much, ladies, for taking time out and joining us on The Money Show today. Just to give a brief overview of our guests to our viewers as well, uh, coming first to Radhika. She's been a veteran corporate and investment banker, independent director at multiple listed companies as well. And she comes with an experience of more than 30 years in corporate and investment banking with the uh, having been working with names like Bank of America, JM, uh, uh, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, DSP Merrill Lynch and a host of other companies. Um, Radhika, hi, just want to start off uh, by taking a look at your journey. You've been at the top of the game for so many years now. You come from the banking world. Talk to us about how your journey has been as a woman professional. Has it been any different or do you think when you look back, could it have been any different for you had you been a man? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Uh, see, one thing I would like to say is that uh, we are in a patriarchal society. And uh, what happens at workplace also reflects uh, the same kind of uh, values, biases, and what have you. So I would say that when I started out, and this was in the 80s, so in 80s and 90s, this whole thing about gender diversity and affirmative action and all those things were not around. So we did have to work hard to make sure that our work got recognized. Uh, to just give you an example in banking, a lot of your performance depends on the kind of relationships that you handle. And initially, most, not just me, I found that a lot of women who joined the banking sector would be given the smaller, the low potential accounts and relationships. So you do start out with certain handicaps, but over a period of time, when you have a track record to back you, things get easier. And from middle and senior levels, you do not experience these kinds of uh, bias at all. Uh, to say that whether my career would have been different if I was a man, uh, perhaps it would have been because as you know, all of us are always striving for that elusive balance between work and family responsibilities. And it is true that most men, uh, I mean, they don't share that much of responsibilities at home. And to that extent, the career graph which a man would have could be a little steeper, I would say. But ultimately, you do end up pretty much at the same level over the years. Right. But uh, would... Are things different when uh, you start out your career? Perhaps now things have evolved a lot from when you started. But were things easier or things more tougher for women back then? For those days. Nowadays, it's much easier. Also, I think more and more women have joined the workforce. I'm very aware that when we talk about Indian participation of women in workforce, it has fallen. And this is also in the informal sector, but I'm talking about the corporate world where many more women have come in. Many more women have done exceedingly well, especially in banking industry. Uh, in fact, I don't know what, what contributes to that, but maybe it is because women are more cautious, they are more careful about money, uh, they have a more analytical approach. I don't know what it is, but in banking, women have done well. 
And perhaps it doesn't mean that in other sectors, women have not done that well. I mean, I was reading the other day that in the civil aviation industry, India has the highest number of women pilots, commercial pilots. It is 12% as against America's maybe half that number. And even globally, it's a very low number. So somehow I feel few women become pioneers in those industries. And then many others feel confident and comfortable to join in those industries and they eventually do well. Okay. Neha, coming to you, uh, just giving you a brief about Neha as well for uh, our viewers who've tuned in just now. She's the founder and CEO of Jobs for Her. This is an online platform which is essentially meant to connect uh, women with companies, community and skilling, helping them start or restart and rise in their careers. Over the last five years, Neha, Jobs for Her has worked with over 1.7 odd million women, 7,000 plus companies, thousands of mentors, hundreds of reskilling partners. Tell us how things have evolved uh, within the industry. How, how easy it is now to find uh, jobs for women. You can disagree with my statement as well if there are any challenges that still exist. Sure. Um, thank you for having me over. It's really a pleasure to be on this uh, show and especially with such esteemed uh, fellow panelists. Um, so I think like Radhika mentioned, I feel like uh, things are definitely getting much better for women in the workplace today than they were in the yester years. Yeah, Even in the last five years itself, we have seen a huge change in mindset that is happening when it comes to corporate India. So I remember when we when I started Jobs for Her five and a half years ago, there were a lot of companies uh, who felt comfortable enough to tell us that they didn't want to hire women, they didn't want to hire mothers, and they didn't definitely did not want to hire women who were returning back to work after taking a break. Versus today, when you see when we started Jobs for Her with twenty companies on the platform, versus today we've increased that number to seven thousand five hundred plus companies. And not only are those have those companies opened up their doors to women who want to get back to work, but they're actually coming up with tailor-made returning internship programs with us by which women can restart their careers through a three to six month internship, during which time they can prove their skills, get upskilled. And not only that, but these companies are actually putting their money where their mouth is and paying us to be able to connect with this kind of a candidate talent pool. So I feel like that there's a big, a very large change in mindset when it comes to corporate India and realizing the kind of untapped talent that was lying when it comes to qualified, educated, capable women in India. You know, uh, it's interesting that you say that people and companies are more open uh, to rehiring women or uh, sort of reskilling them, training them, welcoming them back into the professional sphere. What about career progression? Do you think uh, it's as easy for men as it is uh, for women as it is for men getting ahead in the career, uh, perhaps getting a promotion or a raise? No, frankly, a man, like uh, Radhika mentioned again, a male career graph and a female career graph are very different, right? We're used to seeing a male career graph which is like this. And usually a typical woman's career graph would kind of go like this. Yeah, there'll be many times, many occasions during her career where she will feel the need to scale down, where she'll feel the need to take a break, uh, where she'll feel the need uh, to say no to that particular challenging role or assignment that has come her way. And all these hamper her career progression. So it is more challenging for women to rise in their careers. And in fact, that is the reason why one and a half years ago, we expanded our vision to also figure out how we can get more women at leadership levels. Because we strongly believe that till we don't get more women at leadership roles, you won't be able to see the systemic change that is required in the workforce to get more women participating in it and rising to the top. And like Radhika mentioned, you know, the, when women reach leadership levels, they will become those mentors, those idols, those beacons for other women below in the line and realize that it is possible. Also, it's those women who will be able to change the rules of the game. Yeah, let's keep in mind that today, 
the workplace is built by women, by men, for men, of men. If we want the average working person to also become a woman, we are going to have to change a lot of rules of the game when it comes to policies, programs, uh, networking, culture, benefits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's talk policies and laws and uh, who better than Flavia Agnes who we have on our panel today. She's a women's rights uh, lawyer and a pioneer of uh, women's movement in India focused on issues of gender and law reforms. Flavia, pleasure to have you on board today. Talk to us about uh, legal solutions for gender pay gap. What is the recourse that women can take? We have a lot of uh, provisions in law. For instance, to start with, we have a constitution which forbids uh, discrimination. It, it, it shows equality, which means equality in every sphere. There's also provisions for special protection to women under Article 15.3 and 16.3. So it's not only really equality, but giving some additional uh, facilities to women in order to reach equality. So this is very unique for us and that it's, it's a great leveler so women can access it. Next, we have very specific laws, for instance, like maternity benefit, pressures at the workplace, um, many such facilities are the equal pay for equal work, which many countries do not have, but India started with saying equal pay for equal work, etc. Now, certain cases also have come up which challenge the discrimination that is there particularly the air hostess case, the Nargish Mishra case, where doing the same job, they were labeled differently. Uh, but, uh, women were uh, uh, air hostesses and men were cabin stewards or something like that. And uh, there is disparity in, not only disparity in uh, the earnings and the grades, but also women upon marriage had to give up their job, or at least at the first child. Now, this was challenged for many, many, many cases of the air of this air hostess. And finally, a certain measure of equality was attained. So equality, though given in the constitution, didn't come to women on a plateau. Then there's a very interesting case of Audrey de Mello. Now, this Audrey's case is that, um, again, uh, men were uh, stenographers, men were labeled as Sec private secretaries and women were from the pool of stenography and they were labeled stenographers and the same work they were doing but the pay was unequal and now this was to a private corporate firm it was not government also but yet, yet supreme court held that um, <clears throat> this amounts to discrimination if you're doing the same work the nature of the work is same the salary has to be same grades have to be same so these are some milestone cases for us there's also one IAS officer uh, who challenged it way back in 1970s, <clears throat> where because she was a woman, she was not given foreign posting. So she and her husband were both in foreign service. <clears throat> Again, this was stepped down and said men and women have equality, so there should be equal provision and equal benefits and equal kind of posting. <clears throat> so these are the very important cases that we have. And today, women have a better space generally, but that discrimination still continues. And more recently, we have a law, 2013, <coughs> prevention of sexual harassment at workplace. So a lot of women cannot do the work they wish to do because of the harassment from their superiors or the bosses. So there is a law now to protect even that. <coughs> so these are some important measures that our government has initiated, which are very welcome measures. <coughs> Right. But, you know, often what we see and hear about is that institutions are educating their employees against, uh, uh, you know, any kind of uh, sexual discrimination, sex-based discrimination or sexual exploitation or harassment at workplace. Why isn't this not talked about as openly about your legal rights? Why is, why are a lot of working women still... Um, very conscious about being open, uh, openly talking about their pay parity or talking about the amount of work they do and perhaps are not compensated well enough for it. 
yeah the problem lies in the mindset of the bosses first and foremost and not only bosses of this company but there is certain male bonding that happens across companies so this woman thinks if i raise an issue here and if i have to leave this job nobody else will hire me because they say this woman is a trouble maker it is very dangerous to hire her so women prefer to quietly leave and get another employment and then talk about it so a lot of women come to me they talk about it and they say ma'am please don't mention my name so without your name there cannot be a legal case you have to you have to uh, <clears throat> risk it you have to go out and file the complaint but many a times when women have filed the complaint the case is stuck for a long time and the woman is left high and dry she is anyway sacked she doesn't get another job so there are many many women who have done it and they are very landmark cases so the cases have made certain progress or not made progress but the situation has not changed so lesson other women get is see what happened to her the same thing will happen to me it's better we don't talk so i mean very highly paid officers in uh, corporate sector or public sector have filed the complaints and the case has not progressed so that is a sad part for which i think we, while we have all the laws on paper where we lack usually is the implementation our implementation is not adequate it is not women friendly at all our systems are very very um, male oriented and there is a bonding between men that happens not only uh, across corporate sector but even in the court rooms even when the case is filed so this is a major drawback for us to get gender equality in the workplace i'm sure things are changing but it will take some time absolutely i'm sure um, radhika coming back to you you have uh, been on uh, the boards of various companies you continue to be as we speak also you know uh, what what we understand is there is a certain amount of uh, female representation that is required on companies boards by law but over and above that how many companies do you see proactively take women uh, as directors on different boards okay so let me respond that not just me but many women join corporate boards because of the law because companies act required that every listed company and certain large public companies need to have at least one woman director so i mean i can just share that i had been on boards of non profits and chaired such boards for 12 years but i was never invited to a corporate board till the regulatory nudge was given uh so what has happened in this last 5 years after women join corporate boards is that uh, there are various boards in which you have more than one woman director but that percentage is very small 73% of the boards have only one woman director and if you look at the men on the boards 98% have three or more men on the board so there is a huge gap having said that and this is not my experience i have been fortunate that i i am on every audit committee of the five boards i have joined i chair one audit committee i chair one nomination and remuneration committee and i chair one csr committee which i feel very passionate about but if you see the statistics only 6% of the audit committees of the listed companies are chaired by women only 9% of the nomination and remuneration committees are chaired by women so it is true that uh, there is a lot long way ahead for women on boards to cover in terms of not just having a voice in the boardroom but also leadership positions where they can actually make a huge difference so i'm hoping that what the government has done they've done their bit now india inc needs to do their bit in terms of supporting and welcoming and empowering more women in the boardrooms right and and you know not just meeting the bare minimum obligation but neha if if we talk to you about uh, 
a lot of gender uh, specific stereotypes when it comes to different job roles have you um, are there any experiences that you would like to um, tell us or share with our viewers as well because there is a, there's still a lot of uh, bias or a lot of uh, stereotyping of certain job roles as characteristically a female job and certain roles which are supposed to be quote unquote male jobs yes absolutely i have to tell you about uh, an instance when uh, uh, one of the companies very proudly came to us and told us that you know they have just completed an entire analysis and uh, uh, they have figured out exactly which roles will be suitable for female candidates and which will not be suitable and so they wanted to, they came to us telling us that you know so we have now identified which roles we can give to you to source female candidates for and i looked at them and i told them that i want all your jobs <laughs> i was like i don't think there's any particular job that is not suitable for a female candidate um and um, again this was not like they were badly intentioned they in fact did this exercise because they wanted to get more women into their company but the mindset is the problem right we we think that there is a there are particular roles which are suitable for women and there are particular which are not and the reverse is also true many times we think like there are particular roles in the home which are only suitable for women and which are not suitable for men uh, and we need to definitely change that stereotype and that will change only if we educate our daughters and sons differently now when it comes to uh, corporate india we are seeing also a lot of change happening in the positive direction like for example uh, many large um, industry conglom conglomerates like mahindra mahindra they have started a women only manufacturing plant where they said that even though they're manufacturing auto equipment parts um they still say that we will make sure that the entire plant is uh, operated by women up to the security guard okay so that you can never say that there are particular roles that a woman can do and cannot do and i'm very happy to report that that plant of theirs outperforms all the other plants so while we see all these biases uh, pervading um, and existing there's definitely change towards a better future does happen in a lot of cases you mentioned this mahindra example but otherwise also there are several women who are equally well educated equally hard working have perhaps performed even better than several of their male peers but flavia why is it that they are um, scared of speaking up and if you if you also would want to you know pick a leaf out of your book and talk to us about any experiences that could really um, boost the confidence of women and all the viewers that are watching us right now the government has done its bit so a woman who is sexually harassed doesn't have to go to the police station which can be a deterrent she doesn't like to go to the police station now by law you have to set up internal complaints committees and she, and an hr officer or whoever is designated into these com companies or who have a heads these companies as this information is supposed to be displayed everywhere and every woman is every employee is supposed to know what is sexual harassment where is the committee how you can make a complaint now i don't know whether this is happening most of the training that we are invited to conduct do it in such a cursory job they said it is mandatory so we have to do so people come people go people are not serious it is madam you don't bother you just do your job and you go but i said no we come here to teach you this particular the way, way the committee should function he says no no you know like we are supposed to do this so we are doing it it's okay you uh, since we can mark you that you came here and you did this that's good enough for us we don't have to learn anything so this is a casual attitude into which the hr department is functioning which is very sad because we take a lot of trouble to go there and to communicate to them i have said that uh, when a complaint when when an incident happens and a complaint that is filed before this committee it has to be a written complaint not just oral if somebody comes and tells you orally you have to ask the person to write it down and then conduct an inquiry etc now when this is a such a long drawn process and the incident could be very minor or could be almost invisible there may not be eyewitnesses etc 
and the tendency of the members of the internal complaints committee in general is to disbelieve this woman is to uh, label this woman with certain ulterior motive and that is very sad because this is not the role of the complaints committee now usually there is an ngo member from the outside if the ngo member knows the law very well and is very firm he may be able to uh, bring a change in the opinion of other members but if she is just a puppet you have chosen some you know your husband's friend uh, wife has done some gender training or whatever so we'll invite her so she is also not like you know independent of voice or opinion and if she feels that they have done a favor by including her in this committee so many times the woman does not get justice and if she doesn't get a justice the next thing is to file in the high court the against the committee as well as against the man and against the firm and that becomes a long drawn affair a very long drawn affair in fact in the high court and if she doesn't get justice there she has to go to supreme court so that's the reason we don't by now 2013 act but before that we had justice verma's judgment in 2007 uh, uh, 1997 called the bishaka judgment from then onwards things were supposed to change and by now the things would have changed but sadly this is not the case i mean some change you can see very slow very gradual somewhere but it's not an overall change because when the man harasses the woman many times it comes as i didn't even know uh, that uh, this is uh, this amounts to sexual harassment i just said that she's overweight and she needs to reduce uh, so that's that's not a personal comment i just said that her uh, um nail polish is very beautiful or she's looking very beautiful today or i think yeah her uh, uh, blouse and her uh, underwear doesn't match so she should be more careful to match everything now these are very personal kind of comments but a man doesn't realize he thinks it's a good intention com uh, comment so it's very important to for the staff members or even senior staff members to understand what constitutes sexual harassment as per law so these uh, training sessions are very important if they don't take it seriously then they will never come to know and they will never be able to change the environment within the workplace and that is very sad yeah definitely there's there, there's definitely a very thin line between what's proper and what's improper what's acceptable in a professional setting and what's not and you know despite so many instances and so many um direct or indirect uh, situations women still are a bit wary and a bit uh, conscious or apprehensive to come out and talk perhaps they're worried about losing their job they're worried about losing the trust of their employers or uh, their colleagues but whatever the reasons might be what we need to understand is that they they have a, a, an equal platform and they could come out and speak and address these issues and uh, solve it not not just for themselves but for the larger uh, set of women as well but you know i don't want to be the only one uh, doing the talking or questioning here so radhika i believe you know you had a few questions for our co panelists as well why don't you take on the stage and talk to them and ask whatever there is in your mind sure so for neha i had this question because uh, i also had taken a break in my career when i became a mother and then i know what happened when i wanted to get back and it wasn't easy to get back to a level that you felt you belonged to so my question to neha would be that when women take a break and come back and you help them find jobs do they have to take a lower position lower compensation or they are able to pitch at the level that they left thank you radhika that's a really great question you know and especially i hope you know the women who are on a break are listening to this because um, it's absolutely not true that just because you've taken a break in your career you need to come back at a level lower or a compensation lower than what you had left at or that you shouldn't even get a hike from where you had left yeah depending on what the current pay packages are for that role again uh, what's important to remember is that it's equal pay for equal work so depending on the role that you're going to get back to you should be paid just according to that uh how long your career break was what you did in the career break why you're coming back should have nothing to do with what is the compensation that you should be receiving 
But the same is true from the opposite sense, which means that supposing earlier you were a, a Java developer for about five, six years, you took a break for two, three years, and now you're going to come back from a, in a testing role. Now the package for uh, somebody in a testing role might be lower than the package for somebody in a Java developing role. Yeah. Which means that now your CTC might be lower when in that particular role. But if you are coming back in the same kind of role as a Java developer, you need to figure out what are the current pay packages for that role and whether you are skilled and qualified enough to be able to deliver according to the expectations of the role. If you are, you should be getting that package period. Uh, so your career break really has nothing to do with the kind of packages uh, you should be getting when you get back. Now, again, from a corporate point of view, let's keep in mind that at the end of the day, a salary discussion is a negotiation. And if a woman on a career break is on a back foot and she's trying to justify the break, she doesn't have the confidence. She feels that, you know, anything is fine. Any title, any role, any package, anything is fine. She will then end up getting a much lower salary than what she deserves. Yeah. So it's very important that women do their homework and their research, figure out what are the, what is the right package for the kind of skills and qualification that they bring to the table. Oh, that's good to hear. Very encouraging. Thank you. Um, and I also have a question for Flavia. So, uh, of course you talked a lot about, uh, laws as it apply to workplace, uh, and you also do a lot of work for women's rights. So my question would be that uh, since you would be interacting with women from various different socioeconomic backgrounds, do you find that the issues are different based on those backgrounds or that ultimately it is the same issue regardless of the background? At the workplace or domestic scene? I would say both. Because in okay. a way, for women, both places are so intertwined. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, we work across class or across marginalization. The core issues are the same. Many times there's domestic violence, harassment at the workplace. These issues are the same. They may take on different characteristics depending upon the socio-economic status of that couple or of that family, uh, where they come from, where they, where they are, whether she's working or not working, she's a homemaker or a working woman, all these things matter. But in the end, according to me, the gender roles that the society expects women to have, whether it is at home, whether it is at workplace, are so similar at cross class. And that's the sad part of it. So why you at the at the time of marriage or soon thereafter, you're supposed to give up the job. You're supposed to stay at home, have babies, look after them, look after the home. When they're grown up a bit, then you can come back to the job market. That is expected. But at the same time, you cannot give up on anything in the home front. That has to be maintained. And women want to maintain it so that, you know, they're not looked down on like a career woman or who doesn't want to do our house, household duties, etc. So they work really, really hard to meet both these uh, expectations at the workplace as well as at the home. But when problems come, whether it is in the workplace or in the domestic world, they have implications in the other place. For instance, you are, your marriage is breaking down and you are mentally very disturbed state. It affects your work performance. And it's not only really just upsets your work performance. But if you confide in your boss or some superior, or he asks you probing questions because you're crying and you uh, confide in him, then that leads to sexual harassment at workplace. Right. There's notice this in many situations. So the man tends to exploit her vulnerability. On the other right. side, if there is a vulnerability at workplace and she hmm. comes and confides in a husband, his usual uh, reaction is like, okay, stop working. There's no need to work. So she prefers not to tell him and deal with it. Sure, There's also sure. another problem which women face, which is not necessarily a sexual harassment issue. But when she is very competent at workplace, when she does very well, she has 
itself likes to undermine her performance so that there is no insecurity in a marriage the husband doesn't right, feel right. Like that the woman is doing so well so this is a counterproductive thing <laughs> whereas a man would perform and display his performance and achievements a woman has right. to like hmm. mellow down and uh, and not display her performance in order okay. to save the marriage but in the end the marriage may not be saved at all and oh. then she regrets it so that she is not able to like or she would have risen much higher and she didn't let herself in order to save the marriage and now the marriage husband is fight for divorce because it's right. right. right fair point fair point uh ladies unfortunately we're running out of time we would I would have loved to you know go on with this this is such a uh you know engaging topic but thank you so much for taking time out all three of you this was a very enriching session thank you once again for joining us on uh, the special segment on the money show today slipping into a break right here but plenty more when we come back stay tuned